a Bible tonight, raise your hand. We're in James chapter 3. Get your hand up high if you need a Bible. James chapter 3 tonight. We've um, just had some great teachings by Pastor Emmanuel and Michael and um, a great, great teaching team that God's established. We meet every other week, and it's just been a great time of encouragement for the three of us. Why don't you stand with me while we, we open up to James chapter 3. Oh, you're going to love this one tonight. I don't know what, I don't know what um, title is above the section in your Bible, but mine says taming the tongue. Yeah. Does anyone have something different than that? Untamable tongue. Mm. Control it. All right. Oh, wow. All right. Well, here we go. You came to church tonight, all right? So the Bible says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with a greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. He's so poetic. Check this out. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. (laughs) We'll talk about that in a minute. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Now, check this out. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, watch it here, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Answer? No. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Answer? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Father, thank you for your word tonight in And there, without a doubt, God, without a doubt, we all need this word. We all need this word so that our words can bless your heart and bring grace to those that we speak to. And Father, we need this word tonight because there are wounded people in this room, people who've been hurt by words over the course of their lives. And and those words today, in some cases spoken years ago, still having an impact. And you're present tonight, God. You're present. We want to be instructed, God. We want to speak like our Savior spoke. And we also want your Spirit to move so that those strongholds that exist within our lives from words that have been spoken to us can be broken And those wounds that we carry can be healed. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. Well, we live in a world that that is saturated by words. It's been said, um, according to my studies, that women speak on average 7,000 words a day. And men speak on average three. All right. (laughs) We have three. Do we have four, four and a half, five? (laughs) Men on average speak 5,000 words a day. Um, I don't know, like for those of you who are married, I don't know what that looks like in your household, Um, but, but certainly there are exceptions to this rule. All I'm saying to you is there are a lot of words that we speak on a daily basis. Um, not only that, but on X, formerly known as Twitter, there are about 500 million posts every single day. I mean, think about that. I think it's 135 characters or something like that. Think about just on that platform alone, 
We're not talking about Insta. We're not talking about, we're not talking about Facebook. Just on that platform alone, that's a deluge of words on a daily basis. If you watch a 40-minute TV program, that's an average of 17,000 words. Um, if you read a novel like Crime and Punishment, which probably not a lot of you are reading right now like I am, um, that's about 208,000 words. I'm just saying, like, you think about the volume of words on a daily basis, and as I think about it, I think, man, that's a lot of trouble, right? That's just a lot of potential trouble for us to get into. And the truth is, um, on a personal level, on a friendship level, on a family level, on a city level, on a national level, you can see the impact that words have all around you and even in your own circle of influence on a daily basis. I mean, who in this room, who in this room didn't say something in the last 30 days that they regretted? Who in this room in the last 14 days did not, well, praise the Lord for you. <laughs> that's, that's, that, no, that's good. For the rest of us, for the rest of us, the point is, for the rest, okay, for it, talk to me in the lobby after the service. For, for the rest of us, there's probably some things that we've said that maybe we, we in hindsight would have said differently, or maybe some things that we said that we really, really wish that we could take back. And you know, the thing with words is once they are said, there is no taking them back. I mean, now, that doesn't mean that you're helpless or hopeless. I can't tell you the number of times that I've said something and I've thought, oh, God, you know, please forgive me. And I pray that you would, that you would heal the wound, right? That you would take the potential trouble that I've just caused with my words and that you would turn the whole situation around. I can tell you, and this isn't really the, the point in this part of the message, I can tell you he has been faithful so many times you know, when you come to God in, in, in humility and brokenness and you acknowledge the failure and you're willing to learn from it and grow, He is the God who can step in and He is the God who can turn things around. So look, we, we look at the world today and certainly our world revolves on words, um, so much so that I think sometimes we speak without even giving it another thought. And I want to remind us tonight that speech, words, are a gift from God. They are an expression of our heart, and they are something that we will, like all other gifts that God gives, be held accountable for. So let me just say that again. S speech, the capacity to use words, Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, is a gift from God. It is an expression, ultimately, of our heart. And it's something like all gifts that God gives, um, it's something that we will be held accountable for how we use. In this section of Scripture, there are four powerful principles, um, I believe, that James gives to us that will change the way, potentially, that you use your words. And so tonight, if you're taking notes, in verses 1 to 2, uh, principle number one is this, judge your words or they will judge you. Judge your words or they will judge you. The Bible says not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with a greater strictness, for we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able also to bridle his whole body. So, I mean, obviously, um, there is a strong exhortation to first and foremost teachers, and we'll get to that in just a minute, but I want you to know how he nuances this saying. He says, for those of us who teach, there will be a stricter judgment, um, which means that there will be a judgment for everyone who speaks words, right? He doesn't say that the people who are teachers are the only ones who will be judged for what they say. He is saying that for sure we should be sober-minded about the calling of God that we have because there will be a stricter judgment. But all that to say, there will be a judgment. There will be a judgment. You and I have the freedom to say what we want to say, um, just like Stapleton and Timberlake sing in their infamous song. But at the end of the day, you know we're all going to give an account 
of the words that we speak. Jesus was, he was ministering to the multitudes. He had done mighty miracles. It was extraordinary. There was a moment of conflict between him and the Pharisees, and the Pharisees began to say that Jesus was actually performing these powerful miracles, not by the, not by the power of God, but by the power of Beelzebub, um, a.k.a. the ruler of demons. They made this belligerent statement that was a matter of opinion, and Jesus said back to them, he said, I tell you, Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Somebody say, wow. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words will be condemned. And so these religious leaders, they were speaking belligerently. They were speaking their opinion. They felt like they had the freedom to do it. They certainly thought they had the authority because they were in a position of power um, and no one was willing to speak to power except Jesus. And and he turns around and says something so strong, not just to the religious leaders, but he says it to everybody, that we will all be held to account for every careless word that is spoken. I mean, this is a good thing to remember the next time you want to pontificate on the opinion that's been brewing in your heart and mind. You know, sometimes, sometimes we can be so extraordinarily opinionated. And we think that everyone, you know, really deep down inside wants to hear what our opinion is. And so, so, you know, we feel so free to share belligerently sometimes our personal opinion on a particular matter. Um, And this just reminds us that even in those times, we're going to stand before God and give an account for the words that we speak. Um, Some of you have heard this before. Uh, Anything you can and say will be held against you in a court of law. Some of you have heard that on the receiving end. And, you know, that may be true in um, a human court. It certainly is true in the divine court of God. Um, There is a judgment. We all will be held accountable. The Bible says in Malachi that um, God writes down those words that those who follow him speak to one another. There seems to be a book of remembrance and accounting of all those things that will be spoken. And then for those of us who are teachers... Um, Some of you tonight are thinking, man, that's tough enough, pastor. I'm glad I'm not you, or I'm glad I'm not Emmanuel or Michael or other people teaching. There's an even stricter judgment. And so he says, hey, you might be pining for, you might be desiring to be a Bible teacher and to have a, a position of preeminence and the spotlight and to be on stage, but let not many of you desire that or do that because the judgment will be even stricter. Stricter in the sense of orthodoxy, which means that every teacher has a responsibility to be rightly dividing the word of truth and teaching those things that are right in the eyes of God in alignment with the word of God um, because God doesn't take kindly, this is my southern version of this, God doesn't take kindly to false teaching. God doesn't take kindly to false prophets. You know, God doesn't take kindly to his people being deceived. It would be better if a millstone were hung around a person's neck than to falsely lead somebody into believing something about God that's not true. And so when we, this is one reason why, of course, you guys know, you don't need my opinion. You don't need, you don't, you don't really want my opinion, right? The one thing that we Um, certainly agree on here at Awaken Las Vegas and the Calvary Chapel tribe is that we teach the Bible verse by verse. We're grateful and thankful for the Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. You don't need 40 minutes of a pastor pontificating on his personal opinion on a particular issue. What you need is God's Word because that's ultimately what transforms and changes our lives. And so there is a stricter judgment for teachers because we're called to orthodoxy. We're also called to orthopraxy. Um, That means that we practice what is true as well. That means that we practice what we preach, 
Not only will teachers be held accountable for what they say, teachers will be held accountable for how they live their lives. Um, You know, as you consider the ministry of Jesus and how um, he engaged with the Pharisees that he said to his disciples, hey, listen, you you may follow what the Pharisees say, but certainly don't do as they do, right? Their lifestyle does not back up those things that they speak and those things that they preach. And so for those who teach, for those who lead people, it's not a matter of do as I say, not as I do. It is a matter of do as I say and do as I do. And that's true, not just in the world of leading the church, but but we all have leadership positions as Christians. Um, It is my firm conviction that all Christians are leaders. And so you may be leading your friends, you may be leading your husband or wife uh, in the sense of in spiritual matters. You may be leading your children. You may be a Christian leader in the workplace. People are observing the way that you speak and the way that you live your life. And it's a trickle-down effect. You know, sometimes you might be raising your kid and you might be thinking, man, where did where'd this little kid learn to talk like this? <laughs> well, most likely, I'm just saying, most likely they're a chip off the old block, right? I mean, they just, they're just, it's not always the case because especially today, um, kids are formed by the internet and they're formed by social media. Um, Great book out by Jonathan Haidt called uh, The Anxious Generation. If you're interested on the impact of social media technology and the internet on Generation Z and the Alpha Generation, I would encourage you to get this book. Um, because kids no longer are just being formed by the influence of their parents. They're being really first and foremost formed by social media. And, you know, part of that is back on parents because parents are negligent um, in making sure there are parameters about what their kids are exposed to through technology. So there is that trickle-down effect. Um, I want to encourage you with this principle as we're talking about judge your words or they will judge you. Next time you're about to speak, particularly if it's in a heated moment, um, think about this. Is what you are going to say something that you would say in the presence of God? I mean, just think that through. And uh, of course, that means, and we'll talk about this in just a minute, of course, that means that you have to be willing to push pause before you speak, which is really hard for some of us, but... Before you speak, think about it like this, is what I'm going to say something I would say in the presence of God, um, because the truth is one day he will remind you of it. Verse three to four, the second principle is this, use the power of your words to bring life. Use the power of your words to bring life. Scripture says if we put bits into the mouths of horses, so that they obey us. We guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. The second principle tonight that I, I would encourage you to write down is use the power of your words to bring life. Uh, James, James's poetic point here is that even though the tongue is set by God as one of the smallest members in our body, it is powerful. It is small, but it is mighty. And then, of course, he uses two examples, two metaphors, two illustrations um, to punctuate his point. First, he says, man, we put a, a small bit in the mouth of a horse, and that small bit controls such a massive and strong animal. And he says, not only that, but you know on a ship, a massive ship, a huge ship can be controlled by a little tiny rudder. And so don't underestimate the power of the words that you speak. And I think sometimes this is uh, honestly where we get ourselves in trouble because sometimes we we do that very thing. We underestimate. We forget the power that our words have. And so remember, first and foremost, that our words have the power to bring life. Your words, in fact, can direct and change the course of a person's life. 
I'm sure this is the case for you, um, as it certainly is for me. I, I can remember some of the words of encouragement that meant the most to me over the course of my life, and, and they're so powerful. They're, they were such strong moments. I can remember where I was at. Um, I can remember what I was thinking. I can remember what I was wearing because a, a, small, a small word of encouragement, the small word of encouragement in those circumstances that really lifted up my heart or gave me direction from God or, or you know, they were like apples in settings of silver. They came at just the right time in my life. Those moments when I really needed to hear a word from God and God was faithful to raise somebody up and bring a word of encouragement that maybe sustained me as a, a pastor or strengthened me as a, a dad or gave me wisdom as a husband. I can remember with like pinpoint clarity those particular moments and how they impacted my life. And I'm certain that that's the case with you. You can reflect on your life, and, and maybe it was a teacher, and maybe it was a pastor, and maybe it was a friend that you had. Maybe it was somebody totally out of the blue that you didn't know at all, um, and they really, what they really were was an ambassador from God, and they brought this word that, that encouraged you and lifted you up and brought, it was, it was like water to your dry soul. Some of you tonight, are, you're thinking, man, I want that in my life. Like, I need that in my life, man. Maybe you've been asking for that. You're thinking, God, where is that encourager? I remember years ago, Pastor Chuck was going through the gifts of the Spirit, um, and he got to the gift of encouragement. And it was really interesting because of all of the gifts. He said, maybe more than ever, this is the gift that we need in the body of Christ. We need the gift of encouragement. You know, we need people who are going to speak words of life into the lives of others. And maybe tonight, you know, you're that person and you need that word and you've been, you've been asking. Um, and maybe the fact that that word hasn't come, maybe you, you're not surrounded by encouraging people and, and you feel almost as if um, the picture in my mind right now as I'm preaching is like a, a plant that's wilting. You're like a plant that's wilting and, and you, you so long to have those words of encouragement that will bring you life. I um, believe that God is going to bring that word to you. I believe that God is going to raise up that person, but I want to encourage you until that happens, be the encourager, right? Until that happens, because sometimes you know what happens. Sometimes we are so longing for someone else to bring the word that we forget that we can actually be that conduit of God, that word of encouragement, that person that carries that perfect word that an individual needs that lifts up their soul. And you know, Jesus said this. He said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. The fact is that as you operate in the gift of encouragement, as you're the one who's willing to, to be aware, you roll into the service tonight and you're hungry for God to speak to you and there's an anticipation that he's going to give you something, but simultaneously your, your, your radar is up, right? You're, you're sensitive to the Spirit of God because you didn't come in here just to receive, you came to give. And so your, your prayer has also been, God, lead me to the person who needs the word. Show me that person, God, give me the discernment so I can see the look on someone's face or I can see the person whose body language is just crying out for a word of encouragement and, and help me to bring that word of encouragement, help me to bring that, help me to be that person that brings that word. And what you'll discover is as you step out into that, God in fact will bring life to your own soul. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruits. Death and life, death, I mean, when you and I speak, we have a choice, we have a choice to unleash, it is true, power. And the question is, is what, when you and I speak, what kind of power are we going to release? Are we going to release power that destroys and tears down, and we'll get to that in just a second, or are we going to share the Word of God through the Spirit of God and see that our words bring life to those who need it? 
Um, I think of some of the powerful things that Jesus said. By the way, you're like, man, pastor, there's just so many bad examples of people who misuse their words and speak in ways that they shouldn't speak. Where's the example? Where's the example? Who's the one I can pattern my life after? Well, thanks for asking that question. His name's, his name's Jesus. You know, if you want a good example of how to use your words, just consider the life of Christ and, and look carefully at how he spoke to people. I just surveyed in my own memory the gospel accounts, and these are some of the things that I'm reminded of with respect to how Jesus spoke. He spoke to lead people to God. He spoke to lead people to the Father. He spoke in a way that was encouraging and uplifting. He spoke in a way that brought grace to the hearer. He spoke, spoke truth and love. You know, he did speak challenging hard things, but it was always within the framework of what was in the best interest of others, not just his own interest, and it was always within the framework of love. He spoke the gospel. He spoke sincerely to the Father. I think about the prayers of Jesus and, you know, the beautiful prayer, um, the high priestly prayer in John 17, um, just eloquent and, and extraordinary prayer for unity among the people of God, and then the heart-wrenching sincerity of the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane as he sincerely prayed to the Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. I think about how he spoke in a way that valued people. He valued people. He valued the least among us. He valued those who in the social constructs of the day had no value. He was willing to speak life to them when others were only willing to shun them. He never spoke to tear people down. He always spoke to build people up. He never spoke out of revenge. He never spoke in a way to get even. He uh, chose no words when necessary. There were, there were times where he chose not to speak. And let me just tell you, brothers and sisters, it is better to speak nothing than to speak something stupid. That should have like gotten a bigger amen out of you guys tonight. Like it's better, it's better to say nothing at all than to say something that you're going to regret. And there were times where he was silent. You know, the Proverbs have a lot to say about the person who is willing to choose silence as, as opposed to disclosing the fullness of what's on their heart. Um, he was fearless in speaking the truth. He never lied. He never gossiped. He never slandered. He never reviled. First Peter 2.23, Peter just remarking on his own experience with Jesus, he said this, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. I want to say it again. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued. How did he do that? Like when, you know, when he was falsely accused, when he was being slandered, when he was being viciously attacked, when he was the target of the religious leaders. You know, you would think he would have every right to respond with a, with, you know, a counter attack that was just as rugged as the attack that had been levied against him. But you know he chose not to do that, and he chose not to do that because he trusted God. Like your willingness to not respond in a way that is getting even or making somebody hurt because they've hurt you or degrading somebody because someone's degraded you. By the way, you guys know this is like social media. This is what sometimes social, this is what X, formerly known as Twitter, is all about. I mean, it's just a constant thread of people beating each other down with words. And you don't have to engage in that. Why? Because you trust God. And in the end, God is going to work all things out according to his righteousness. Amen. The third thing that, that I appreciate, the third powerful principle that James gives us is um, in connection to making sure that we use our, the power of our words to bring life. Don't use the power of your words to hurt people. The third thing is don't use the power of your words to, to hurt people. The Bible says uh, in verse 5b, 
How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. The third thing, the third thing that I want to encourage you with, this powerful principle is don't use the power of your words to hurt people. Um, James beyond a shadow of a doubt, right? And very poetically, like I said, talks about the real destructive power of the tongue. Um, It is a fire. It is a world of iniquity. It defiles the whole body. It sets on fire the, the course of nature. It is set on fire by hell. You know, you think about some of the words that were spoken in the scripture, like crucify him. You know, you think about some of those those words that were powerful and hurtful um, that were levied against our Lord, give us Barabbas, it was said to Pilate, or the religious leaders walking in front of Jesus saying to him while he's suffering on the cross, while he's hanging there naked, crucified to the tree, plated crown of thorns, beat down on his head, body scourged, face beaten beyond recognition, and still they had the the heartlessness, the cruelty to say to him, you saved others, come down from the cross now and save yourself. I mean, the cruelty that people unleash on each other sometimes is absolutely astounding. When you were a kid, I'm sure you said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And you know that is a really, really dumb saying. Because the truth is, for the most part, your body can heal from, your physical body can heal from from getting hit with a stone or getting beaten with a stick, but your heart, when, when words hit your heart, the lasting impact, the lasting pain, the lasting wounds that can come from hurtful words that have been unleashed on you literally can control you for the rest of your life. You know, sometimes when I have the opportunity to biblically counsel people, sometimes I'll listen to people talk about, you know, verbal abuse they have, they've been exposed to over their life. Maybe it was a spouse or maybe it was a parent. Um, and it can be years down the road. And sometimes I'll lovingly challenge them with, with this. It's like, that person hurt you then and was controlling you in the moment with those words. You can't let those words control you any longer. 10, 15, 20 years down the road, those words are still shaping your self-image. Those words are still shaping how you view God and the, the earthly father picture that you project onto him. You know, words for sure, can hurt us over the course of our lives. I think about Shimei. Shimei, you remember when David was leaving Jerusalem and Absalom, his son, had usurped the throne and David's on his way out and, and Shimei's cursing David, throwing stones and David's mighty men are like, man, let's, let me just go cut that dog's head off. And David's like, no, let him say what he has to say. Maybe what he is saying is from God. There was a humility in David's life, and yet he was strong enough in his relationship with God to not allow those words to have a lasting impact on his life. The hurtful words that you and I speak to, to one another um, can, damage, can damage each other for a lifetime. I've seen families torn apart. I've seen churches torn apart. I've seen friendships torn apart. And certainly today in our own country, we see a country being torn apart by words. We see uh, differences devolving into anger and hatred, vitriol. We see uh, rhetoric in our nation right now that is, that is stoking the flames of division maybe like never, never before. And of course, it's all amplified by technology and social media platforms. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 27, a worthless man plots evil and his speech is like a scorching fire. Pro- Proverbs 29, 11 says, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, 
but a wise man holds it back. Next time, next time you feel the urge, you know, to unburden yourself and let somebody have it, remember Proverbs 29, 11. A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. I just want to encourage you with, with a, a couple of principles to help you. In those moments where you're tempted, like I'm tempted to, to let somebody have it, to give somebody a piece of your mind, to get somebody back, to even the score, I want to encourage you to consider three things. Number one is wait. This is the acronym. It's W-A-C. It's WAC. Okay? Don't be, don't be a wacko. It's, it's WAC. Choose WAC, all right? Number one is wait. Just, just before you speak, put your mouth on pause. I mean, some of us as parents, we tell this to our kids, but the truth is as parents, we need to take this advice ourselves. Just, just put your mouth on pause. Wait for a moment. I'm <coughs> just wait for a moment. Settle your heart before God. And before you speak, before you whip off that text, before you post on social media, just hit pause and stop. And the second thing is ask. Go to God and ask him to help you see the perspective from his vantage point. Ask for the wisdom of God. Ask God to soften your heart. Ask God to see the situation from the other person's perspective. Ask God to give you a word that is going to lift somebody up instead of tearing a person down. And the third, the third letter is C. It is choose. And so choose the path that leads to life, not to death. Choose the words that are going to build up, like I said, not tear somebody down. So next time you're in the moment and you feel like letting somebody have it, wait, ask, and choose. All right? Wait, ask, and choose. Say it with me one more time. Wait, ask, and choose. The fourth principle tonight is your words indicate the condition of your heart. So he wraps up by saying, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. <clears throat> From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. The final principle that James gives us here is that our words indicate the condition of our heart. Um, James is really strong here. He says, no man can tame the tongue. But the truth is, what he's saying is, apart from the Spirit of God, like unless you're born again. And we know that that's the case because otherwise, James would not say, these things ought not to be so. From our mouths as followers of Jesus, we shouldn't be blessing God on the one hand and cursing people on the other. So, so it works like this, man, you're praising God tonight, you're giving an amen, you're singing songs, you drive out, you go to rainbow, someone cuts you off. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Someone cuts you off. Like, what is the word? What is the word that is on the tip of your tongue? And you, <laughs> whack. Thank you so much. That's right. Wait. Ask. Choose. <laughs> I love you for that. Thank you. You know, what is, because sometimes, look, even when we're by ourselves, it's like, well, you know, we have the freedom to say whatever we want to say because the person's not in front of us. And it's like, no, you don't. Because in, in that moment, what you're doing is you are stoking the fire that will ultimately make you like a ticking time bomb ready to go off. You will be like a volcano that is ready to burst. What is happening in your heart is as important, sorry. Embarrassing when that happens. You guys all right? <sighs> Say hi to one another. <laughs> I'm good. Thanks, bro. <clears throat> I've got three shots of espresso there. That's <clears throat> Thanks, Mariano. 
So uh, obviously, like in his poetic way, again, he's just illustrating, he's illustrating the point. If we are in a place, look, if we are in a place, if we can gather together on a Sunday or a Thursday night, and man, we can sing our hallelujahs at the top of our Lung, uh, lungs, and at the same time, we can go home and let our husband and wife have it and beat down the kids with our words. James is saying, that's a problem. Like, that's a problem. I mean, it's a problem for a whole bunch of reasons. If you want to give your kids a reason to not follow Jesus, then, then, then speak like a fool. I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying, like, when you speak like a fool... When, you, when there's a, a, a difference, a, a, a hypocrisy, a distinction between the way you comport yourself on the property at church and on the property at your home, your kids are going to have every reason to say, Christianity is not for me. The whole Jesus thing is just a sham because I don't see it working in the life of my mom or my dad. And if it doesn't work in their life, why would I want it in my own life? James is just saying, you know, as boldly as he possibly can, out of the abundance of our hearts, the mouth speaks, right? What we speak from our mouths is a reflection of what is happening in our hearts. And those were the words of Jesus. He said, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. Look, it's not just... It's not just the words. The words are just transporters. The words are just carrying the sentiment of our heart. Like we are such complex beings. God has given us the capacity to have a vocabulary and then to roll a deck of vocabulary to select words in sequence that express what's on our hearts. And it's not just a matter of the words that are a problem. The issue is what's happening at the source. The issue is what's happening here within myself. And if my words are full of things that are defiling and unrighteous and not uplifting and they tear down and they don't lift up and they bring baggage and burdens to other people, it's a reflection that there's impurity that's dwelling within my own heart. It's not a matter of saying the wrong thing. It's a matter of our hearts being pure. And so... James calls out the hypocrisy. He gives us, he gives us, um, I think, uh, you know, he gives us a rule to measure by. He gives us uh, a, a trail to follow. Tonight, if you're having a, a hard time with speaking those things that build people up, if you find yourself in a place where, man, you do let people have it, and if people jumped on your social media, they would wonder just exactly what kind of believer <clears throat> you are. The issue is a deeper issue. There's an issue within the heart. And tonight, I think that God is calling us to two things. I think, number one, God is calling us to reflect on that, to reflect on that strong truth, to, to take account of our own words, and then to consider if our words are reflecting a heart that is filled with love and purity and God's grace, or if our words are reflecting a heart um, that is defiled, you know, that isn't really based on building people up, but tearing people down. And the second thing is this, uh, that if you've been wounded by words, I really do believe, and I felt this as we were worshiping, that tonight is a night of healing for you. Tonight is a night of release. Tonight is a night where God wants to, to break those chains that have been binding you down. Tonight, God wants to tear down strongholds in your life because there have been words that have been spoken to you that have been become spiritual strongholds that are actually hindering you in your relationship with God and the full experience of everything that God desires to do in your life. Because those strongholds that have that have been built in your life have impacted the very way that you see God. You've projected a, an earthly image onto your heavenly Father. That those words that have been spoken to you have bound you down and impacted your earthly relationships. They've controlled you. And tonight the Spirit of God is present among us to bring the deep healing that we need in our lives. 
The Spirit of God is present to pull down those strongholds. And you say, well, how does that happen? Strongholds are pulled down in my life and your life when we remember what God has spoken to us. Don't prioritize something that some human has spoken to you over what your heavenly Father has spoken to you. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 24, kind words are like honey. They are sweet to the spirit and bring healing to the body. And your heavenly Father tonight, he loves you. His heart is filled with tender mercies and unending kindnesses. He has a purpose and a plan for your life. He has pleasure in you because you put your faith in his son. And no one could love you more than the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 